Hi, my name is Lisa Argyle, and I'm an assistant professor of political science at Brigham Young University. I study public opinion and political psychology using computational social science methods. In this lecture, we are going to talk about how experiments can be advanced using computational methods. Uh, good morning. I'm really excited to be here. As Chris mentioned, I'm a SIX alum, and it really changed the tra trajectory of my research career um, in ways that I didn't expect when I attended SIX. And so I have had a great time learning about computational social science and continuing to do this research in a variety of ways. Today we're talking about experiments in particular um, and some of the computational advan advances that are enhancing our experimental possibilities. So here's a little overview of what we're going to cover in this lecture today. We'll start with um, a brief primer on the logic of experiments. Why do we do experiments and what leverage do they give us over answering research questions that we can't get from other kinds of observational empirical work. Then we're going to jump into what computation, computational approaches can add to our social science experiments. Um, and we'll look at that in three different areas, the first one being the setting and the subjects that are involved in the experiment, the second one being the interventions, what we actually do or what kinds of treatments we give to people in our experiments, and the last one being the measurement of outcomes in the experiments. In each of those sections, I'll give you a little bit of an overview by what we mean, by what's traditionally done in social science experiments in this area. Then I'll give you a running example. So the running example we're going to do is work co-authored with Chris and some other um, scholars who I will introduce in a minute. Um, it's called Perceived Gender and Political Persuasion, or the Unite Dem Experiment. Um, so we'll use that as a running example. I'll introduce the research question a little later in the talk. Um, but we'll use that as a running example to kind of show how computation can be applied in each of these different areas. And then the final thing I will do is sort of very brief, almost shout out style um, introduction to other research just to give you a bigger sense of the scope. Um, I think some examples is helpful to apply sort of the big general concepts to what we can actually do in practice. Um, and so I will use uh, about 10 other examples, three or four per section, of other kinds of research to give you an idea of what, what's the scope of what's going on out there in computational social science experiments. When I say experiments, we need to define the term a little bit. Um, in lay conversation, in, and even in a lot of academic disciplines, non-social science disciplines, um, we use experiments very loosely. And it sort of means, I'm going to experiment on something, it just means I'm going to try something and I'm going to see what happens. And if I don't like it, or if I'm still curious, I'm going to try something else and see what happens. That's not what we mean by experiments in social science. So when I say experiments here today, I mean the very narrow, specific technical definition of a randomized controlled trial. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are two important terms to define there. The first one is controlled. This means we have subjects that are separated, that are allocated into two or more groups. Sometimes you have multiple treatment groups. Um, but at least two groups that undergo an identical experimental process except for whatever that specific thing is that your treatment intervention is interested in. Um, if we're thinking about this in terms of observational research, we'd have an independent and dependent variable. In an experiment, you, the researcher is experimentally manipulating the value of that independent variable for one group and not for some other group. The other um, absolutely central part of an experiment is that it's randomized. So the allocation of subjects into those two groups is a process done by researchers using a formally random process. There are lots of other kinds of natural experiments, quasi-experiments, situations where we can find groups that we think are equivalent um, and do analysis of those. But what we're talking about here today is a randomized controlled trial, meaning the researchers are conducting the randomization into groups and we can compare the groups um, across those different metrics. So this is a little bit of an overview of what a typical experimental design would look like. Experiments, yeah, the logic of experiments has been around for a long time. It starts coming out of clinical trials, clini uh, clinical medical trials. So that's an easy and intuitive way for a lot of us to think about it. Um, so that's kind of how I have depicted it here. Um, it, and it's been around for hundreds of years. Um, the logic of randomization and application of a treatment in comparison to a control is something that we've been doing for centuries. 
Um, and social scientists have adopted this logic because it gives us a lot of powerful leverage. So here's what it typically looks like. We have some study population. We'll talk in a minute about whether that um, population is more or less representative of what's going on in the typical world. But for the purposes of the experiment, it's just important that you know the study population. You know the boundaries of who, of what entities are involved in your experiment and what entities are not. Following that, you need some kind of random assignment procedure. Um, rolling dice is one example of a formally random kind of procedure. There are lots of other technical ways that people do this. There are lots of built-in randomizers on a survey or in other settings. Um, but there has to be some kind of procedure by which people are assigned into the treatment group versus the control group that is not dictated by any characteristics of the respondent or by the researcher's judgment. So then we end up with two groups. We have a treatment group. We have a control group. The treatment group receives the treatment intervention. The control group typically receives some kind of placebo intervention. So they're going through the same process, whatever that is, of being part of the experiment. Um, you know, if, in a medical trial, maybe they are taking the same daily pills or injections or whatever that is, just to make sure that the experience of being part of the experiment is not what's driving whatever outcome change you have. You have to have two groups that are essentially identical on every metric or experiment, experience that they go through, except for the actual treatment. So one of these treatments um, is whatever the researchers think is going to have some positive effect on somebody's health. Uh, the placebo intervention we would expect to have no effect, a sugar pill in essence. Um, after that, we have to observe the outcomes. So we need to gather data. Uh, that's a really important step. Um, and we, we have to think carefully about what kind of data we need. Um, so make sure that it's aligned with the theory. Um, and, and gather the outcomes. And we need to be gathering the same outcomes in the same way for both the treatment and the control group. And our final step to come to any conclusion from the experiment is to compare those group out outcomes and evaluate what's happening. The reason this works, the reason this gives us any leverage, is because of that random assignment procedure. Um, so we go into the experiment expecting we have a population of people. If we gave them, you know, if, if we left them all alone, we would expect some kind of outcome for all of them. If we gave them all the treatment, we would expect some kind of outcome. So we're just going to separate that into two groups. And because it's random, we don't expect that there's any systematic difference between the people who get the treatment and the people who don't. So if we had left the people in the treatment group alone, we would expect them to have outcomes exactly like the control group. If we had given the control group the treatment, we would expect them to have outcomes exactly like the treatment intervention. Exactly meaning, on average, um, within sort of the same statistical confidence that we would have. Um, because it's randomized, we can rule out any other kind of explanation. Um, so this is, this is the really important thing that experiments give us. Um, randomized controlled experiments can identify causal relationships. So that's something we're often seeking for in other kinds of observational research. But it's very hard to achieve with just statistics because there are always possibilities that there are other observed or unobserved factors that are affecting the relationship that we're hypothesizing and that we're modeling with our statistics. In an experiment, we know that the only thing different between the treatment group and the control group is whatever little thing that we have, as researchers, done to the treatment group and not to the control group, whatever intervention we have given to one group and not the other. Um, so this lets us identify a causal relationship. We know what the effect of e exposure to whatever treatment we have is on the outcome. That's super powerful. <laughs> That's really, really important. This is why experiments um, give us so open, open so many opportunities for analysis in social science research and in computational social science research, because they, we can narrow down on a specific causal relationship. There are a couple of other terms that I want to introduce. The first one, and these are ways that we talk about, that we can talk about experiments. People use different terms in different fields. In political science, these are fairly common terms. Um, but they're also, I think, useful concepts across fields to talk about what um, what features of experiments we should be paying attention to. So the first one is internal validity. So this means within the experiment, within the population of people who are involved in your experiment, the data that you actually collect, um, the ob observed average difference in outcomes between the treatment and control groups can only be attributed to the treatment intervention that you had. So this is what we were just talking about is that causal relationship within the study. It's internal to the study and the process that you have. Um, Essentially, if you have a good randomization procedure, 
we have good internal validity. If you have good randomization procedure and you're, you have a comparable experience between the treatment and control group, um, we can attribute whatever differences we see in the outcomes to just the differences in what the treatment and control group experienced. We also have external validity to consider. And in external validity, the people in the experiment, it, we're thinking about, we have the study population, but then what happens, how do we draw inferences from that study population to the bigger picture, to the bigger population that we care about? We have a set of people in the experiment, we know exactly what happened with them, that's our internal validity piece. Do we expect the same thing to happen if, across other populations for people who were not involved in our study? So we have two considerations here. The first one is that the people in the experiment are not systematically different from the population that we want to draw conclusions about. So that means if we have an experimental population, this is an example that comes up a lot. Um, psychologists often use lab experiments where they use college students as their population. Um, and then there's a lot of debate. Do college students have the same psychological processes that people outside of a university setting would have, or are they systematically different from the rest of the population in one or more ways? So we're thinking about that translation of the people in our experiment, and do they, do they represent the rest of the population, or can we expect the treatment effect, that relationship, to extend beyond the scope of just the, the one experiment that we're running? The second point of external validity is that we want the treatment process to mirror what really happens in the real world. And so we may be able to get some kind of treatment effect, but if we're doing, having people engage in some really weird task or doing some, in some setting that makes them uncomfortable or behave differently than they do in their normal everyday lives, the extension of what we're doing in the experiment to the real world may be a little, a little bit compromised. Right. So we need a treatment intervention that sort of mirrors what people actually do, that plausibly is something that they would encounter in the real world and that would explain how they uh, would react or behave. So that's our overview of experiments. We'll now move on to sort of the next piece of this question, which is what can computational methods add to these social science experiments? What do we gain through the advances in computational social science that are exploding right now? Um, the first point I want to make, and this is a little bit of a caveat, is that computational social science is a big tent. Um, hopefully you have encountered that um, already as you see the varieties of methods and tools and approaches that people are using in a bunch of different disciplines. It's a very interdisciplinary endeavor. Um, so I don't want to draw really fine boundaries around what's a computational social science experiment and what isn't. Um, but I do just want to give you an idea of the range of things that are possible. Um, I don't feel like strict boundaries on the meaning of computational social science are really beneficial for us. And the advances that are coming are probably things that we can't even imagine yet. Uh, the other caveat I want to make here is that n not every experiment needs to be a computational social science experiment. Um, there are huge advantages, there are huge benefits, and we'll talk about some of the um, problems, some of the obstacles that face other experiments, how computational social science can overcome those. Those aren't obstacles for every theory, and they're not obstacles for every experiment. So it's not that every aspect of every experiment needs to have a computational element, um, but they can be really beneficial in the right setting, with the right match to your theory and your, your data. Okay, so the first element where we're gonna talk about what computational social science can add to experiments is the setting and the subjects of the experiment. So a little bit of background. We have typically, uh, absent computational social science experiments, typically three kinds of experiments that social scientists are running. The first one is a lab experiment. In this kind of experiment, you're getting a population of people, you're having them physically come to some kind of lab location where they participate in some experimental process designed by the researcher. There are some downsides to that. Um, physical travel is hard to do, so it becomes very expensive. You have to pay people a lot of money for their time or compensate them in other ways in order to get them to come. Um, it's geographically limited to the people who are able to come to your experiment or you, know, you have to be running experiment in many sites uh, across the country. And so there's a, there are some limitations to a lab experiment. Um, We'll talk about some of the benefits of lab experiments 
in a moment as well. Uh, but as we're thinking about the setting and the subjects, people are coming into an unfamiliar environment, they're doing a task that may be unfamiliar to them, um, and there are limitations on the population that you can reasonably expect to do that and the size of the experiment that you can run. So this leads a lot of people to look to field experiments. So instead of bringing people into a lab in a field experiment, the researcher goes into a field, meaning they go into people's lives and how they're actually living them in their, uh, in their daily routines and experiment on what they, what they are already doing sort of out there in the population. So instead of bringing people into a lab, we're taking researchers into the field and, ex um, and exerting some kind of treatment and control within sort of a, a setting, within a natural setting. The final kind of experiment, uh, yeah, so one of the benefits of field experiments is um, that involves a lot of people in their everyday lives. So as we're thinking about that internal and external validity, um, field experiments are great because you're doing things in people's daily lives as they may be actually expected to do them. Um, that adds a lot to what we expect, how we expect experiments would work out, outside of the lab, out in the real world. Uh, but it does raise challenges of feasibility, of the technical cost, um, some ethical questions, because oftentimes in field experiments, people don't know they are subjects to experiments. The final kind of experiment is a survey experiment. Um, these have become very popular across the social sciences, um, in part because we can take this experiment to people. We don't have to bring them into a lab, and particularly with the rise of digital surveys, online surveys, it's very easy to, to expose people to some information, to some treatment, um, give them you know, treatment and control groups, different kinds of questions, different kinds of information, different tasks that they can reasonably do within the confines of a survey, um, and compare treatment and control groups. This is great because it gives us a huge variety of people, it gives us access to a very representative sample, um, but there are some limitations in what we can observe and what we can expect people to do within the confines of a survey. So that's a little bit of the, the groundwork of what kinds of experiments are out there. Computational social science experiments, in my view, just blur all of the lines of all of those. <laughs> You'll see computational social science experiments that are essentially survey experiments and are described in that way. You'll see computational social science experiments described as field experiments. Um, or as virtual laboratory experiments. They really blur the lines and use elements of all of these, um, compu of, of all of these types of experiments um, to create something that's new and, and different, um, that doesn't neatly fit into any of these boxes. Uh, that comes with some major benefits. It also comes <laughs> with some drawbacks. One of the huge benefits is that people can um, participate in this experiment from um, any location. Right? The development of online tools and people's online technical capacity really helps develop um, how many people can participate in the experiment. Um, but it also gives a lot more opportunity for researchers to manipulate other aspects of the experiment that go beyond what they could do in a survey. Um, so now let's get to an example. Uh, we'll finally get to something a little bit more concrete and show you what I mean by a computational social science experiment um, that checks a lot of these boxes. So this is perceived gender and political persuasion. This is the research team involved in this project, and we'll use it as a running example. So I will just introduce sort of the theory and the setting for it right now, and we'll come back to other parts of it in later, um, later moments. So a little bit of background. Uh, women globally are perceived as less capable leaders than men. This is from the Reykjavik Index for Leadership by the Kantar um, Public and Women Political Leaders Organization. And what you see here is a difference. So they ran a survey in a whole bunch of countries um, and said, how, who's, who's a better leader in each of these settings? Is it men? Is it women? Are both equally good in each of these different kinds of settings? They're different occupations, a whole range of things. Um, and so a score of 100 would mean they said men and women were equally capable of being leaders across the board. Um, Iceland comes very close to that on average. Uh, other countries trail off rapidly. Um, the United States is at a score of about 76, so just about average. Um, so what this demonstrates is that people don't see women as being as capable of leaders across a wide variety of occupations and settings. 
One of the reasons for this that social scientists have, have identified, um, and in particular here I'm drawing on work by Chris Karpowitz, Tali Mendelberg, Jessica Priest, Olya Stoddard. Um, they've done a bunch of work with small groups in lab experiments and field experiments um, with how women and men talk to each other when they're in a decision-making setting. And what they find is that just putting more women into a conversation, you can have a group, you can add more women into the conversation. Um, this is experimentally manipulated, so the researchers are randomly assigning how many men and women are in each of those conversations. And what they find is you can add more women into the conversation, but that doesn't give women influence over the decision that is made by the group. So having a seat at the table does not mean having a voice, necessarily. So there's something that happens in the dynamic of group conversations where men and women can talk to each other, but men's attitudes and opinions are more likely to become the outcome of the group, to become the decision of group, than women's attitudes and opinions. This is even if you account for um, the accomplishment, the resume, the <laughs> abilities of men and women in the group on a whole variety of metrics. Um, women do eventually achieve a similar level of influence under the right conditions. So if they are a majority of the group, and if the group has, or if the group has to decide everything unanimously, um, then women's voices start to have a little bit more sway in the group. Um, but we're interested in this research in finding out why it is that women don't have as much influence in conversations, and can we do something about it? So the first theory we're looking at, um, we have two theories. The first theory we're looking at is that Maybe what's happening is women are saying exactly the same things as men are in the conversation, but they're just not getting credit for what they're saying. So this has come up in popular discourse a lot recently. Um, you may have heard about mansplaining, so this is a New Yorker magazine. Let me interrupt your expertise with my confidence. Um, a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek way of talking about this theory, uh, but the idea is that if women were just seen as men, they could say the exact same thing and they would have more influence in the group. Another example of how this comes up is uh, a little bit more recent of a term of heap heating. Um, when a woman suggests an idea, it's repeated by one of her male colleagues and he gets all of the credit for it. Um, so the idea here is that maybe it's actually just that other people in the group are seeing women as, or, or discounting their ideas, are seeing and hearing women and then not paying as much attention or giving as much credence to what women are saying as they are to what men would say in the same setting, or if men say the exact same thing. The other possibility is that maybe women just speak in less authoritative ways. So it's possible that women say things that undermine their authority a lot. Um, one example of this that comes up a lot is women apologizing a lot as they speak. You may have heard, and there's some research on this, that women do use a little bit more hedging language, um, they apologize more, they do things that sort of undermine their own authority or, or sort of manage expectations a little bit more. Um, another example of how this comes up is maybe not even just through the words that women are saying, but through their behaviors. Um, you see this with ideas about leaning in or power poses, that women need to physically change their presence or the tone of their voice or something about how they're delivering and communicating, which will give them the authority that men have in a conversation. So the, those are the theories that we're trying to test. And our question, the research question in this project, is do women have less influence in a conversation because people are discrediting women's conversation, contributions or because they're actually saying something different in a way that is undermining, in a less authoritative, authoritative way? So the setting we're looking at this in is the 2020 Democratic primary. So we're looking just among Democrats. We have Trump as the nominee for the Republicans. The Democrats are trying to figure this out. There are a slate of very probable possible candidates um, and lots of conversation about who should be the nominee in this election. Um, so we gather a sample of people. We use a survey firm, YouGov. We identify 760 Democrats. Um, and ask them to download an app. Uh, this is an app that we built particular, specifically for this research project. Um, so that's an example of sort of the computational element here is we're taking people and putting them in a setting that's relatively familiar. It's a chat-based interactive app. People are very familiar with chat-based apps in their everyday lives, but it's not exactly what they're doing um, because we're asking them to download and test this new app and have this new conversation. So we hire YouGov 
Um, we get a sample of Democrats. This is um, during the primary season up until Super Tuesday. And then we give them a pre-survey. In order to get paid for participation in the experiment, they have to complete the pre-survey. They have 14 back and forth messages on the app, so they have to interact with the other, the other person says something and they respond, and that exchange has to happen 14 times. Um, and then they have a post-survey. They are talking in this conversation about who should be the next presidential nominee. So what, who's the Democratic challenger best positioned to beat Donald Trump in the election and should be the nominee for the Democratic Party? So this is, these are some screenshots of the mobile app that they downloaded um, and some of the instructions that they're asked to do. <clears throat> yep. Um, we're going to stop that conversation there. I'm going to leave you on the edge of your seat and what's happening. Um, right now we're just talking about the setting and the subjects. And so that, that's the setting, that's the subjects, and you can see the computational elements being built in there, um, that people are being asked to interact with this app um, and download it, it you know, in this new custom built way for this experiment. Some other examples. This is the lightning round of a few other examples of what else you can do to bring computational elements into a social science experiment. It's not possible for everybody to build an app. It takes a lot of technical expertise, in some instances a lot of cost. Um, that's not a feasible option for everybody. So let's look at some of the other ways that people are involving people in research in a computational social science way um, that sort of gives us some of the benefits of a lab study and that we can have people do more extended tasks, but also maintains and, and a little bit broader in scope than what you would get from a survey experiment and maintains some of that field's reality or the, the generalizability of a field experiment. So one example is just using existing platforms. So this is research by King, Pan, and Roberts. Um, they were interested in censorship in China, and so they posted a whole bunch of messages on a range of social media applications in China, um, and then they saw which ones were actually posted and which ones were posted and removed so that they could track censorship. Censorship is really tough to study because we don't see the content that doesn't ever make it onto a platform. And so they can't just use observational research for this, so instead they run an experiment. And they experimentally manipulate the content of the messages so that they can figure out exactly what content is going to be censored and what content is not going to be censored. So in this study, they just use platforms as they are. Um, and I, this is also a super interesting study because the subjects of their experiment are not online. A lot of times when we think about computational social science experiments, we're thinking about experimenting on the users of platforms. Um, in this case, they're not experimenting on the users of the platforms, they're experimenting on the administration of the platforms and on the governmental policies. And so it's a way that they could use a computational social science to test a theory, um, some insights they already had from observational work, in a systematic way to really get to that causal question of what was happening um, in Chinese censorship. So there's our first example. Example number two is to partner with people in industry. Um, there are some ways to do this with big platforms. This is a little bit older study when partnering with Facebook was very new. Um, it's become a little bit harder, I think, to do with these big platforms and a bunch of what they, they have some more red tape um, to work through along the way for good reasons. Um, I think for good ethical reasons to think about that. Um, but there are lots of other kinds of partners that we can think about part, uh, you know, joining forces with in industry. So this is an example of political scientists and Facebook researchers who were um, partnering during an election season. And they looked at how information about who else in your Facebook social network, um, who voted in your social network, how many people in your social network said that they voted, and giving you some information about that, exerted social pressure on people to vote, and found that social influence does have a mobilizing influence within the um, platform of Facebook. A third example is to build your own platform. So we've seen one example of that with the Unite Den experiment. Um, another example of that, and one that's been um, the recently published book, Politics with the People, by Nablo, Estering, and Lazar. Um, but they've been working on this research for probably 15 years. And they built an app where uh, legislators could communicate with their constituents. They could have a virtual town hall with their constituents and they invited a randomly selected subset of constituents from these legislators' districts. 
to have this conversation with them. And they looked at what happened under different kinds of settings and conditions in this conversation to find out what made these connections, these representative connections between people and their government stronger. Um, so that's another example of an app that's built so that people can do something virtually that would have been very, a, a lot higher cost for people to participate if they had to do it in person. The final example I'll give is um, back to some six friends and alum. Um, Empirica is a virtual lab for experiments um, created by Amatuk Becker, their colleagues, Hooten, Payton, Watts, and Whiting. Uh, so this is an online platform, an open source online free platform that you can go and use to create a virtual lab-based experiment. Um, there are other great examples of this, um, so I don't mean to say this is the only one, but they've done a very good job trying to make this accessible and usable for a, for a wide variety of research tasks. Um, so if you want people interacting in real time in some kind of virtual environment, there are these kinds of apps. Um, the Unite Dem app, uh, we're hoping to uh, put in, into a, a form that other people can use on an application process. Um, so other people who are developing these apps, you may be able to piggyback on their work if they're doing something like that. Uh, the computational social science community tends to be very open and friendly and willing to share, uh, you know, replicability and open science are important values. Okay, with those examples, We'll move on to the next piece of this, which is about the nature of the interventions. So what is happening in the experiment? We're back to the slide, uh, because I want to talk a little bit more about the kinds of interventions that are possible in each of these kinds of experiments. So lab experiments are fantastic because they allow you to do basically anything you want. And at the end of that, you can measure basically anything you want. You bring people into a lab, and from the minute they arrive to the minute they leave, and possibly even before and after that, um, you can manipulate whatever aspect of that experiment you want, and you can measure whatever kinds of outcomes you want. So you get a lot of control and a lot of possibility of the kinds of tasks people can engage in, um, you know, physical tasks, mental tasks, emotional tasks, uh, anything, right? So the, the options are very wide open with lab experiments on what you can have people do. Um, that lets you test a lot of theories very directly and, and very concretely. Right? You can have them do exactly what it is you're theorizing and um, look at the outcomes that you, that you hope to see. In field experiments, there's still a huge range of possibilities, but it is a little bit more limited by what you can insert into people's daily lives. Um, and how you can measure those outcomes. We'll come back to outcomes in a minute. Uh, but that becomes a little bit harder, because when you're doing a field experiment, you have to come back to people and measure what they're doing in some way. So you either need behavioral data that you can easily and unobtrusively collect, or you have to go back to people and solicit their participation in a post-survey, and that becomes a little bit harder. So you have to think a lot more about the kinds of interventions that you can do, and how to get people to engage in the experimental task in a way that still fits in their everyday lives, in a way that you can randomize treatment and control, particularly without spillover to other people. There are lots of complications to experiments that we've kind of glossed over. That's a, um, a big question for field experiments. Uh, but you can still do a lot of things that have a lot of potential to impact people's daily lives in a big way. Survey experiments are probably the most restricted on the kinds of interventions that you can give people. Um, Survey experimental researchers are very creative. They're having people do a lot of different kinds of tests. But in general, you're limited to information that you give to people. So you either show them a question in a different way or you give them a different piece of information. And that information can come in audio or visual or text format um, in a bunch of different ways. Or you can have people engage in tasks. So some kind of self-affirmation where they reflect on the good positive qualities they have about themselves, some kind of empathy task where they think about their relationship with another person or how they would feel in someone else's shoes. So there's still lots of possibilities, um, but they're sort of limited to what you can administer or people can self-administer typically in the context of a survey experiment. Computational social science experiments open up the range of things that you can do in experiments a lot. Um, probably not to the level of a lab experiment, uh, 
Um, there are lots of lab experiments that are doing things, you know, medical interventions that you need a lot, you, you need people there to administer sensitive equipment carefully. Um, psychophysiological measures that you would need somebody there. Uh, but computational social science experiments can sort of expand what you can do beyond what's possible in a survey experiment in a way that feels more like a field experiment intervention but can be easily controlled and manipulated on sort of a shorter term with easier measurement of outcomes. So that's, that's the sweet spot we're trying to hit often with computational social science experiments. Um, a few, so we're back to the Unite Dem example. Uh, this is the experimental setup of this experiment. So we have a bunch of people. We recruited them to download this app and have a conversation. They're having a two-person conversation. There are two people involved. And we're manipulating the gender of the person, of the people involved in the conversation. So in our control condition, there are men having conversations with women. They are represented by avatars that look like men and women. In the experimental conditions, we uh, randomize their gender a little bit. So as they come into the app, they see the screen. There are a set of avatars, set of people kind of circling around, and it says we're going to find you a partner, and then it puts that other, partner's part other person's avatar, the partner's avatar, and their um, initials. We randomly assign some gender-neutral initials to that um, to each of the participants in the experiment. So they see their partner's avatar and these initials, um, and they sort of infer the gender based on the color and shape of that avatar. So we have a set of treatment experiments. Um, sorry, a set of experimental conditions within this treatment. Uh, in one of those conditions, well, in two of those conditions, it stays a conversation between a man and a woman. So in reality, behind the scenes, it's a man and a woman having a conversation. But in one of them, we take the man and we give him a female avatar that only his partner can see. He actually doesn't know he has been assigned this female gendered avatar, so we expect him to still basically continue behaving like a man would in the conversation. Um, but the partner thinks they're having a conversation with a woman. In the other experimental treatment, we do the same thing, but we assign a woman a man's avatar. So the woman doesn't know she's being represented as a man, but we think the, the partner thinks they're talking and having this conversation with a man, and so they believe they're having, you know, they, they're interacting with this person who is saying all of the things they would say as a woman as though they are a man. So what this experiment, we then have two final conditions, which I actually won't talk a lot about today, um, but where we actually do change the gender of the people in the conversation. So it's two women having a conversation together and two men having a conversation together to get that baseline of what we would expect if they were really having the conversation they think they're having. So what this experimental design lets us do is sort of separate those effects. Um, we talked about, or se separate our theories. We talked about one theory being other people are perceiving men and women in different ways, and so when women talk, if only they were perceived as men or treated like men, then they would have more influence in the conversation. And that's exactly what we're doing in this experimental condition. They're having a conversation, but they're being treated, and they're saying all of the things they would say as a woman because they don't know they've been presented as a man. Um, but the other partner thinks they are talking to a man. So in, in theory, and our expectation is that this will increase women's level of influence um, in the conversation. That it, because they're being perceived as men, if, if that theory is right, if what's really going on is that women are being treated differently by the other people they're talking to, then being treated like a man should increase their influence in the conversation. We expect the opposite thing to happen for men. When they're talking in the conversation, all of a sudden somebody thinks they're a woman, we would expect them to have less influence in the conversation. So that's what we're doing. Oh, I was there. I just skipped it. There you go. These are our hypotheses. Um, the first one, that women will gain influence relative to their male partner when represented by a male avatar. The second one is the opposite, that women will lose influence um, relative to their female. Oh, sorry, that should say men. There's a typo. Men will lose influence relative to their female partner when the man is represented by a female avatar. Um, we also have some other hypotheses that 
Um, correctly labeled men will have the most influence in the conversation. So we sort of expect people's behavior and how they're being perceived to, to add together. So when people's behavior is consistent with how they're being perceived, both of those things kind of add up and we'd expect correctly labeled men to have the most influence and correctly labeled women to have the least influence in their conversation with people who are mislabeled sort of somewhere in between. And we also expect that men and women will use distinctive language in their conversations that is not impacted by the gender of the avatar that's used to represent them. So we expect some differences in gendered behavior. And we'll use some text analysis later to look at whether that's actually true in practice. And that lets us separate out a little bit of what's going on with how people are behaving in the conversation versus how they're being perceived in the conversation. The reason this is valuable, the reason this research design is valuable in this context, and what computational social science gives us that we couldn't do before, is it is almost impossible to manipulate people's gender in a lab experiment setting, right? Because there are so many other cues about gender. It's not just, you can't just say, you're talking to a man or you're talking to a woman. There are so many cues about tone of voice, about body type, about how we carry each other, that it's a whole package of things that you can't just manipulate one piece of it and leave all of the rest alone. But because we can work in this computational setting, in, in this app that we created, we can manipulate how their gender is being perceived without having to change anything else about their you know, sex or biolo biological gender or gender performance or any of that. So we can, it, it opens a door that wasn't previously possible by having this conversation in a way where we can uh, have an anonymous conversation and we get to dictate how people are presented to each other in this experimentally random way. Um, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, it also lets us move beyond what a lot of survey experiments are doing. There's tons and tons of survey experimental research on gender. We have learned a lot from that research. But most of it describes, so for example, in political science, we use this research a lot, and there will be a male candidate and an identically resumed female political candidate, and we'd say, how do people respond to these candidates? Um, but it's sort of this like one-shot experience where we say this is, you know, this is gender and we expect people to pick up on their cues, but there's a lot of evidence from sociology that gender is something that sort of develops dynamically at, throughout the course of interactions. And so this lets us people have an extended interaction with somebody um, where they can really develop a gendered re response as opposed to just a one-shot first impression kind of thing, which is a lot more how gender works in the real way, uh, in the real world than how we typically sort of morselize it into a survey experiment. All right, a few other examples. So here we're thinking about the kinds of interventions that people can do in a political, in a computational social science experiment. Um, so what we've done is manipulate the avatars within a conversation on a social media app, but there are lots and lots of other pe things people can do. Um, so one great example of this kind of work, again, using platforms that already exist, not having to build his own platform, Kevin Munger is doing research on Twitter. Um, and he sees a bunch of racist language on Twitter, and he wants to see if it's possible for somebody to intervene and say, hey, that's racist, you probably shouldn't say that. Um, and so he conducts an experiment where he changes the profile of the person who responds, the hypothetical person. In reality, it's a bot. Um, so what the... In the experimental intervention that he conducts is creating a bunch of these different profiles and having them respond in particular ways to content that is automatically detected. Um, this would not be feasible for real people to do, to read that much content, to identify all of these tweets, to respond to all of that. It may be feasible, but it would take an army of research assistants working around the clock to read a lot of stuff. Um, so computational advances have really made something possible um, through the use of bots and careful programming uh, that would not have been possible in the pre-digital era. Um, what he finds is that really popular white male uh, bots, so when the avatar on Twitter is, has a bunch of followers and is a white man, they are more effective in this kind of centering about uh, in sort of norm enforcement about anti-racist language on Twitter. Uh, the next example is simultaneous interaction games. Um, this is one of the really difficult challenges for survey researchers uh, because people have to, if you want people to interact with each other, and we have 
a lot of reasons to believe that our social world is very connected, that how people interact with each other matters a lot, but it's very difficult to study those kinds of interactions. Um, so the options previously were either to get into people's interactions in the field, uh, which is possible but very difficult, um, or to bring people into a lab and have them interact, but in that case we're generally having people interact with strangers, and it's logistically difficult as a research assistant on one of these kinds of ex lab experiments in a previous phase of life, it is very difficult to get all of the people into the lab at the same time to do your experiment. Um, and surveys people are typically taking independently at their own, on their own, at their own time. Um, and so it's very hard to have them have any real interaction. Survey experiment experimenters have done a lot of work to simulate interactions, to have hypothetical interactions with other people. Um, or to do things in sort of an asynchronous way over time. Uh, but having real-time live interaction between participants is a really powerful um, tool for social science and a, and a whole that was kind of a hard problem to solve. Um, so in this study, which started at six, five years ago, um, Josh Becker, Ethan Porter, and Damon Santola uh, have people interact in an online platform. And so they're giving feedback, they're interacting, um, and their theory is that uh, people may be bad at processing information. We know the wisdom of crowds is good, and if you get a bunch of people together, they can share information, make better decisions. But what if they're partisan? Does polarization hamper this effect, um, hamper people's ability to share and receive information and make good decisions. And what they find is actually that people are still able to come to good conclusions, even if there's a lot of partisan divide within those groups. And they're able to do this by putting people into this online virtual environment um, and have them interact in this new way. So this is another kind of intervention um, where they reveal information about the other participants, their partisanship in particular, uh, and are able to see what happens in an intervention that would have been very difficult to conduct in, uh, without computational social science advances. Um, our last example for this segment is um, virtual reality. Um, so this is, virtual reality was talked a lot about probably 10 to 15 years ago, uh, but virtual reality technology has become much, much better since then. And I haven't seen as much conversation about virtual reality and social science experiments over the last five or 10 years, which is surprising because we have much easier access to virtual reality capabilities. Most people's phones can accomplish it pretty well. Um, but in this particular virtual reality experiment, um, the authors put people in a virtual reality setting where there is a quickly coming wildfire. And then they look at how daughter's cardiovascular how their heart rates, how their cardiovascular activity changes um, in response to this high threat search situation if they have different cues from their mother as part of the experiment. So if they can hear their mom's voice, um, if they can see their mom, if they, you know, how their mothers can help them manage a very intense oncoming threat. Um, what they find is that uh, if mothers and daughters have a pattern of this kind of reassuring language and conversation, they can have a huge impact in that moment of threat. So it's not just mothers across the board, but it is a reflection of their existing mother-child relationship. Um, the reason this is a great example is it puts people in a very realistic setting that is not something you could ethically put people into in other experimental situations. Right? So exper virtual reality opens a lot of doors for the realism and putting people in settings that would be um, ethically problematic or difficult in other uh, kinds of research. All right, we're moving on to the third and final section of this. Um, <clears throat> the measurement of outcomes. Outcome measurement is super important. <laughs> um, and I can't stress this enough, so I have a whole slide on it. Measurement is really important. Um, experiments are magic. I don't say that lightly. Uh, randomization does amazing things for our ability to get causal inference on a research question. But all of that can be undermined if you don't have good measurement of your outcomes in the experiment. Right? Just having randomization of your treatment does not mean you can test your theory well. You have to measure the right things at the end of the theory, or at the end of the experiment. Um, 
the limitations of measurement strategies that we get in observational research, and there are lots of measurement strategies, and they are very, very good, all of those limitations still apply in experiments. Right? So we know people are spotty in how they respond to surveys. There are lots of biases in what people will tell you, what they won't tell you, what they're willing to say, what they are able to say, what they're able to recall. Um, all of those biases and problems with survey data still apply at the end of an experiment. So not only to run a good experiment, you not only have to sort of get experimental research right, you have to get the empirical measurement side of it right. Um, the same is true for uh, text data. Um, it's not like you magically get to the end of a project and the limitations of text analysis suddenly go away, right? Um, text analysis is super powerful. But uh, there are also some limitations to the kinds of things that you can infer. Um, so uh, the digital trace data, um, all of the limitations there still apply. Administrative records, um, if you want to match people, if you want to track people, all of that still applies. So you have to think very seriously about how to measure your outcomes in an experiment. Good measurement, the ideal, good measurement, um, and there are lots of ways that we never actually meet these ideals, but this is what I think we should be striving for. Good measurement is aligned with your theory. So whatever it is that you believe you're looking for, whatever it is you believe the effect of your treatment will be, is what you need to measure very directly, as directly as you can possibly get. Um, one of the beautiful things about experiments is you sort of know the theory right up front. Uh, and pre-registration has become a big part of experimental designs, especially among computational and social science folks. Um, so we should be stating, we should know from the moment we design the experiment, we have some theory about what treatment intervention we want to implement and how we think that's going to affect some outcome that we're really, really interested in. And so we need to make sure we're measuring that outcome right. And you know, pre-registering and being clear from the up front can really help with making sure that theory is clear and aligned with the measurement you're, you're conducting. It should also be devoid of biases. That's really hard to do, especially if you're working with survey data. We know there are a whole host of biases, a whole host of things that can affect how people respond to surveys. Um, so we would like it to be devoid of biases to the extent that that is possible. But computational research does open up a whole bunch of new possibilities. So typically, um, lab experiments have a lot of possibilities. You're bringing people in and you can measure anything about them, their interactions, um, you know, their sweat conductivity, their uh, eye tracking response rate, a whole bunch of other possibilities. Um, survey experiments are a lot more limited and a lot of field experiments. We're typically using administrative data. We're using survey data. Uh, those are your key outcomes for experiments. They are still the key outcomes for most computational social science research. Often it's still people following up with the survey at the end of their experiment to see what people are doing. But there are a whole bunch of other new possibilities, including digital trace data, matching to other kinds of digital databases, uh, text as data. This is probably the one where I'm seeing the most growth right now, is people running experiments with open-ended text kind of responses and then doing text analysis to look for experimental treatment effects. Um, image, audio, and video data. Uh, I've seen lots of growth in those areas as well. People having interactions in virtual environments where we're collecting image data or collecting audio data or video data of the participants, which can then be analyzed in important ways. Um, the analysis of an experiment is very straightforward typically. Right? You're just comparing an average from your treatment group to an average from your control group. Um, it's very statistically simple to analyze an experiment, or it should be. And there are reasons why that's more complex. If there's high level of noncompliance or attrition or other kinds of factors, if there's a possibility of you know, spillover of the treatment to other participants. So there are lots of things that make it more complex and you have to make sure you get right. But on the most basic level, one of the beauties of experiments is that they are simple to analyze. We're talking just running a t-test, a comparison of means test is all it takes to analyze most experiments, or many experiments. Um, but when we're using computational data, we're bringing in things that is much more computationally complex to analyze. Um, at the end of all of this data, we're still comparing our treatment to our control group. Uh, and seeing what effect our experimental treatment had, but we can be doing that with a bunch of other data besides just responses to a survey question. 
All right, we're back to our Unite Dem study, our running example. So in this study, we have three key outcomes that we look at. Um, there are a few more components of this in the paper, but for today, we will just talk about these three outcomes. Uh, the first is an aggregate influence index. So we have people take a survey, they interact in this environment, um, they have a conversation with another person, and then they take a post-survey. In the post-survey, we're looking at how one partner changed their ranking of their partner's top candidate. So if I'm the person whose influence I'm measuring, we're looking at my top candidate. Who was it that I liked best coming into the conversation? And was I able to move my partner's ranking of that person at all? Do they like the part candidate that I like better after the conversation than they did before the conversation? So we're looking at that in ranking. We have them rank who's your top favorite candidate, your second favorite candidate, your third, and so on and so forth. We also have them use a thermometer rating to measure that. So that's where we say on a scale of 0 to 100, how much do you like um, this candidate? How warmly do you feel towards this candidate? Uh, this is a standard measure in political science research to sort of get people's general affective orientation towards a candidate. Um, we're also looking at the partner reported influence. So we also, if I were measuring my influence, we asked my partner, did the person you were talking to change your mind about the candidates at all? And then they can rank that on a scale. And we're taking those three things and putting them together into a composite index that says, just did I have a lot of influence on my partner or not? The second measure we're using, um, again from survey data, is the average difference in the partner's rating of all of the known candidates. So we ask them which candidates have you heard of. We don't ask them to rate and rank candidates that they have never heard of before. <laughs> they won't have any information about that. But of all the candidates they've heard of, um, you know, what's the difference between my score and your score for all of those candidates before the conversation, and what's the difference after the conversation? Um, so we're looking at, in these conversations, do the attitudes come closer together over the course of the conversation that they're having? The final thing we're going to look at is the conversation text. Uh, this is the most sort of computational element in the outcome data that we're looking at. And we're looking at the femininity and masculinity of the words used by each of the partners in the conversation. So here's the results. We've left you on edge waiting on this experiment for long enough. Uh, here are the results of this experiment. Um, what we find is relative to, so your first line there, is men talking to women who know they are men and women. Um, and when we look at what happens when we label a man as a woman. So it's a woman, man talking to a woman, but they're both presented to each other as though they are women. Um, what we find is that it really hurts men's level of influence. In the baseline conversation, exactly as we expected, men have more influence relative to women. So this is just a gap in that average attitude ranking. Higher values mean that men have more influence. Lower values mean that women have more influence. In the baseline condition, men have more influence than women in the conversation. Unless we tell the woman that that man is actually another woman. And then all of a sudden, men don't have nearly as much influence in the conversation. So that's exactly what we hypothesized. That's what we expected to have happen. What we didn't expect, and where our hypotheses were wrong, is that mislabeling doesn't help women. So presenting a woman to her partner as though she is a man does not help her have more, have more influence in the conversation. If anything, it makes it worse. It's not a statistically significant difference, but it's moving in the direction of being worse. Women actually have less influence in the conversation when they are presented as a man. Not what we expected to have happen, uh, but what what we have discovered in looking at the data is that there is something about the gendered expectations. That people come in expecting men and women to sort of play per particular roles in a conversation. We have societal norms about how this conversation should go. And so it does seem that for both men and women, when what they're doing doesn't align with what we're expecting them to do, they don't seem to have as much influence in the conversation. The next set of outcomes is this attitude convergence or divergence over the course of the conversation. So our baseline here is our same gender conversations. Um, and what we would expect to see, if you're having good influence and good conversation, we expect people's attitudes to kind of converge to each other. 
We're not saying which person is necessarily moving, but we would expect people to sort of come into more agreement or have more similar views after the course of this conversation if we're having good influence between the partners. Um, that's exactly the opposite of what we see. So relative to how much movement there is in a same gender conversation, uh, when we mislabel one of the partners, their attitudes get farther apart over the course of the conversation. Uh, that's a statistically significant effect for when we mislabel men as women. So that's where we're seeing the most treatment effect is actually when we, when we mislabel men as women, it undermines their influence and their attitudes actually get farther apart at, over the course of the conversation. Um, women are not helped by being mislabeled in terms of their influence and their attitudes get a little farther apart but not a significant difference there. The final measure we have is the text-based measure. So we're looking at what's going on in these conversations, what's happening to lead to these effects. Um, and so we use uh, this paper by Roberts and Uteik, and they created a dictionary of masculine and feminine words related to politics. So they came up with a list of words, and then they had people on MTurk rate how masculine and how feminine do you think these different words are. So we now have a dictionary of words that we can apply and a metric uh, if they use this word, that's a more feminine word. If they use this word, it's a more masculine word. That's what we're using. Um, that's what we're applying to this data. And here's what we find. Um, so the correct labels are the black lines at the top and the bottom. When people are correctly labeled, when we have men and women who sort of know that they are men and women talking to each other, they use the more masculine and feminine language. Right? So men are at the top, women are at the bottom. Um, language more to the left is more feminine, language more to the right is more masculine, and people, they sort in, and follow those scripts and use the most masculine and feminine language uh, when they know the gender of the other person accurately. Mislabeling just completely muddies the water. Um, so mislabeled men and, and mislabeled women, when they're talking to each other, um, use language that is more feminine. And, Yep, and women, when they're mislabeled, use language that is more masculine. This is super interesting because only one of the partners is being treated. So we've told one partner, your partner is a man, when really they're a woman, but that woman is also changing her behavior. That's what the bottom show, panel shows us. The mislabeled woman doesn't know she's been mislabeled. She just knows how her partner is talking to her, and that changes the behavior and the language that she uses over the course of the conversation. Right? So there is something that's going on in this interaction that develops over time where we end up in sort of this muddy middle ground. Right? Uh, men and women, when they're talking to each other and they know their gender roles, they stick to a script and they stay in sort of the most gendered language. When they're not in those roles, both partners move. And they're responding to each other, they're responding to this weird gendered situation, they're being influenced by their partner less, and they're using different language. They're, they're speaking in ways that are sort of counter-stereotypical for how you would expect men and women to be speaking in that conversation. So that's what we find. <laughs> um, we'll move on to a couple of last examples, and then we are almost done. Um, so, Example number eight for this. Um, online behaviors. So what, what we've used for the outcomes in the Unite Dem example is some survey data. Again, very typical in computational social science experiments. We've also done some dictionary-based text analysis using these ratings of ma masculinity and femininity of words. It lets us get a little deeper into the conversation than we can with just the survey data. Um, this example is about online behaviors. Um, so what, they, uh, what the authors of the study do is a field experiment um, where participants, they have people install a browser app that tracks what news sites they visit. And then they give them some incentives, some experimental incentives, so they have treatment and control group, they give them some experimental incentives to change some of their browser settings in ways that would move them more towards content that they would not normally see. So ideological content from the other side of the political spectrum. And they look at what happens over time. They have some survey rating outcomes, again, very common. Um, but they are also tracking people's browser histories. And over the course of eight weeks after 
implementing this intervention, they can look at the browser history and see that it's actually a pretty durable change. And people do continue to change their media diets after this intervention about the browser settings. A second example um, is using text analysis. So we've done text analysis in a dictionary-based method. Um, this paper uses structural topic models to do that text analysis. Um, in this project, they asked people to give stereotypes about party supporters and partisan polarization. Um, and then they use text analysis to look at what topics come up as people talk about their own and other parties um, using the structural topic model approach. So it's another example of a way that we can use text data after an experimental intervention to look at differences across the kinds of topics that a treatment group uses and a control group uses. And our final example is video data. Um, and this, this is becoming, like I said, more common. Um, and especially as we're getting a little bit better tools to handle video data and analysis of video data, um, it's becoming a little bit easier to do in computational experiments. In this experiment in particular, um, the authors talk about, or they, the authors use video data to do eye tracking. So they're doing conjoint experiments. And one of the features of conjoint experiments is that people are given a whole bunch of different like pairs or profiles of some, something that they're interested in. Uh, and they randomly vary some of the information about it. And they do this a bunch of times over and over again so they can find out what information is important in people's decision making and where, what are their attitudes about that information. You know, giving them this information makes them more likely to like this candidate or like this profile. And giving them this information makes them less likely to like it. And here they're using eye tracking software to actually find out what is it people are looking at. We're giving them a whole screen full of information, but what is it that people actually look at on that screen as they are looking at these conjoint profiles? So they're running this conjoint experiment, which is a typical survey experiment method approach, but then layering onto it this very technical um, computational approach that would not have been possible uh, without sort of widespread use of video and webcams. And so they can do eye tracking in real time on the survey experiment to find out where people are looking on the page and what profiles um, they think, or what profile information is important in influencing their outcomes. Okay, wrapping up with a couple of conclusions. Um, the first conclusion is that experiments are very powerful research tools for answering causal questions. So social scientists are using them a lot, medical scientists, across disciplines, lots of people are using randomized controlled trials because they give us so much leverage over answering the research questions we're interested in. Computational advances are opening up a lot of new doors for social science experimentation. Um, in the subject, subject recruitment and the setting of the experiments, the kinds of people we can reach, how, where and how we have them participate in their experiment is opening up in a whole bunch of new ways that make it a lot more cost effective and a lot more feasible to bring a big variety of people into the study. Um, it's making it more possible to do complex interventions. So the design of our interventions is the scope of that is getting much larger with computational social science advances. Um, as we're thinking about the internal and external validity of our experimental studies, the intervention designs are giving us a lot more of that external validity. It's letting us do things in people's everyday lives with broader populations of people and also interventions that are more reflective of what we're really doing. This is, I think, one of the big important things that we found with the Unite Dem experiment is that by giving people an extended interaction, we learned some new things that we wouldn't have been able to do if we were just doing a one-shot survey experiment. Um, that something develops over time as people have the conversation that we would have completely missed otherwise. So having interventions that can reflect the real world better or that can um, go beyond the scope of what's possible in other settings. And outcome measurement. We're getting, we can move beyond <laughs> survey data, although we often still use that to supplement it. We can, um, incorporate a lot of other kinds of data into our experiments because computational advances are making it more possible to collect a big range of things. Um, careful research design is essential. Uh, there, I'm trying very hard to avoid giving you a best practice of here's how you run an experiment. Um, it has to match your theory and your research and, and the design and needs of your experiment. So there are settings where lab experiments, survey experiments, field experiments will be more effective than a computational approach. Um, but 
pay careful attention to that research design and make sure you're lining it up very carefully. All right, that's all I have for you to, for now. More later. <laughs> Experiments are a very powerful tool of social science research that can help us understand causal relationships. Computational advances open new doors in the kinds of experiments that we can conduct and the ways that we can understand the world.